Coming up on Theater Talk. Blaine Carey Glenn, Glenn Ross is a great play. How about this production? This production is that it's actually an immersive theater production. What? Where they put you in the mood <laughs> of the guys being fleeced on stage by charging $377 for a premium seat <laughs> and $10 <laughs> for a ginger ale <laughs> at the bar, which I sadly now know firsthand. <laughs> and, <laughs> Elizabeth. And it is just, it's, if you think of it as a meta <laughs> production where the audience is fleeced, like the guys in the play. I mean, it's just brilliant. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm producer Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Michael, Happy New Year. Yes, same it's to you. It's 2013. How exciting. But before we move forward with Gusto, we want to talk about the season that's just ending. Indeed, uh, just after the holidays, we decided to um, rip down the mistletoe and take out the Christmas tree with the drama critics here in New York City who have uh, uh, opinions about all the shows running on Broadway and some of the shows that didn't make it very long this season. Joining which us... Is most of them. Most of them, it's true. It's been a kind of a dreary season, but there are a few highlights which we will get to. Uh, we are joined tonight by uh, my colleague at the New York Post, Elizabeth Vincentelli. Welcome, Elizabeth. Hello. Uh, Scott Brown, a very uh, funny, witty writer at New York Magazine. Welcome, Scott. And our old friend Charles Isherwood of the New York Times. Welcome, Charles. Thank you. You look like you've been through Old friend. I'm the senior member, I guess. <laughs> and veteran <laughs> theater critic Charles Isherwood of the New York Times. So he, he's, he's old, he's witty, and I'm what? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant and insightful. Oh, and French. <laughs> Welcome all. All right, let's start off with some of the good things, though, first of all. Um, I really enjoyed, Elizabeth, the rather delightful and boisterous revival of The Mystery of Edwin Drood at the Roundabout Theater, Rupert Holmes' uh, musical from the 80s. Did you have a good time at that? Yes, I had a very good time. It's, uh, as you said, it's very enjoyable. It's uh, the right amount of kitsch, and it's a fun little romp. It's not going to destroy any of your brain cells. Well, we should say that it's based um, on the uh, unfinished Dickens novel, uh, and it's a mystery, and the audience uh, solves, or the audience votes for who well, the murderer is at the well, end What's of the interesting show. in that show is that the, the high concept is part of the show, as opposed to the casting, which seems to be the case with Broadway producers now. Their idea of a high concept is, Mo I'm going to get Kitty Holmes in a play, and that's, that stops right there. <laughs> uh, whereas there, the concept is in the show. You know, at least it's right. something. Now, you're an Anglophile. you you you, you got to get kicked Yeah, out. I loved it. I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, it's not... You know, a major work of musical theater, but actually, I was in, impressed by the score, uh, which I'd heard you know several times. But some of the songs are really lovely, mm -hmm. um, and as you say, it's you know it's a nice trifling entertainment, but it's not something that is necessarily going to be you know revived every season or every ten years. Mm -hmm. It was kind of nice to see it. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you get a sense though that the cast is having a good time. Cheetah Rivera, Will Chase, Jim Norton as the master of ceremonies. I mean, they just seem to be having as much fun as the audience is. Yeah, no, I'd agree. I, I mean, I think that to me was the joy of it. I, I, I'm not as big a fan of the score. Score, but uh, I, I enjoyed it quite a bit, nonetheless. And uh, and half of it is just you know watching all these you know great theater hams. Yeah, not necessarily Hollywood bold-faced names, but like big theater names competing against each other for audience love. I mean, yeah. and you know, and doing that kind of openly. Whether you know, it's usually being done sort of covertly, and <laughs> yeah. this time it's literally well, like you know, they're, they're hams playing hams. Exactly, yeah. it's, it's total open. It's, it's, they it's, can it's, get away with it because it's a right. second-rate uh, Victorian musical troupe, right. and they're, they're not supposed to be good actors. So right. they're having right. a fun time being second-rate che cheesy kind of actors. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, Speaking also... of which, <laughs> <laughs> you're you back have, on Smash. I, I'm back on Smash, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> I'll drink to that. <laughs> <All right. laughs> you should see how fruity some of my line readings are in the upcoming season. Uh, something else I want to talk about, which is also good, you guys all seem to like, is the revival uh, from Chicago of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Uh, definitive production, Elizabeth? I, I don't know if there's such a thing as a definitive production, but this one would get pretty close to a kind of platonic ideal of that show, I guess. Although my personal regret is that it's always done in this naturalistic way for a play that is not naturalistic. Mm. And I really would like to see someone like, really mess with it, like, seriously. Well, <laughs> like, not while Edward Albee is alive. I don't think he allows people to He does not to allow it. Yeah, it. and well, I don't blame him. I mean, Beckett was the same way. He didn't want people, you know, turning his plays into naturalistic theater. Uh, you, you enjoyed this very much, right? Oh, I think it's terrific. I mean, you know, it's a revelation to see a production where George is actually, you know, in many ways the emotional focus of the show, whereas Martha is usually dominating the stage from the beginning to end. Right. And Tracy lets 
really proved himself as every bit as good an actor as he is a writer, I think. And it's on your top uh, top of your list for the best of 2012, right? Yeah, it's my number one. It's one of my favorite plays. Um, I, I first saw it in uh, in Washington like a year ago, and and I uh, would as soon as, as as he started talking, as soon as Tracy Letts actually started uh, speaking George's lines, it, the the voice that's been in my head for years when I imagined George, that's it. It was a very old lady with warts who was very rich. <laughs> and, I, and I think there was something also that, you know, bringing that kind of uh, meaty Midwestern Chicago thing into it instead of having it be like... New England, starchy, is it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think it's been done. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think it also goes to, to, to what Charles was talking about, like the sort of like George is usually easily overwhelmed by Martha and then, you know, when the tables are turned, that's a that's a big deal. That's a big. That's like, it's almost like a twist. And in this one, it's not so much. I mean, but does it make complete huh? sense wait, 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 if wait. Martha isn't isn't dominant? That was the one thing to me. I loved him. I thought he was terrific. But it, but my interpretation of the play is she has to be such a big monstrous slatternly broad. Self identification would, going on right here. <laughs> that he would be with her all this time. That they would have that kind of relationship. And that was the one thing that I, that didn't quite make it for me. Amy Martin's a wonderful ac actress, but I didn't. I she, she, she was. was a little too low horrible, key. horrifying enough to, to justify Why this she relationship. Why would be horrifying? Because if Martha's grotesque. What? No. Be, why, why would she be? Just, I mean, when you're going through the whole play, that the, the balance of their relationship that she's oh, gee, this the overbearing time. woman and that he has to then, in the course of the play, twist it around to take over. And that, to me, it started out with him on top and then they didn't have any place well, to go. Well, may, maybe right. then he's the monster. Wouldn't that be interesting? I mean, that's just, uh, why, does, why does it have to be her? But I think, actually, if you read the play, he's always the one who's in control emotionally. I mean, mm -hmm. she's making the noise, but he's the one who is saying, you've gone too far, Martha. He's the one who's saying, back yeah. you know. He's kind uh, of the writer and she's the performer. It's just right. why is he there? Exactly. He's well, Susan, the, Susan and I, I, we're replacing Tracy Letts and Amy Morton. <laughs> after the, after the, uh, that I would you. like to see for maybe 10 minutes. Why would he be there at all? So. <clears throat> all right, now, uh, well, I let's, think he needs her energy, actually. Let's address, <laughs> let's address uh, David Mamet, all right? <laughs> <laughs> it, took us, words, it took us four minutes to get let's there. Let's run him down. <laughs> All right, David Mamet is considered one, like Edward Albee, one of the great playwrights of the 20th century. And yet, these new plays he's been coming up with, I find unwatchable. I mean, he had a play that lasted four or five performances, The, the Anarchist with Patti LuPone and um, um, Deborah Winger, which uh, you all hated. And this production of Glengarry Glen Ross, uh, which... Uh, Elizabeth has the only one who's seen it yet. What do you think of it, is, Elizabeth? Is he overrated, David Mamet, Elizabeth? Well, it depends when, when, what David Mamet you're talking about. <laughs> right. Well, first, I didn't actually hate The Anarchist. You didn't? I thought that was a potentially Stagger. interesting play. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. I, 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 I didn't like it, but I didn't hate it. Uh, I think it's so rare to have a play of ideas on Broadway that it's almost like, uh, it, it just stands out just because of that. So we have to pay attention. It doesn't... Reward but we can't kind of pay attention, attention because the writing is so turgid. Well, it is bad, but uh, I think <laughs> yeah, no. But good. actually, <laughs> actually enjoyed reading the play, and it's not a. And then realized it's not a play. No, it isn't a play. It's that's not a that's play. my problem well, with hello, the play. Is it's way right. What so is it? Right. It be a play? It's it's an essay. It's a dialectic it's that he has you know put together, it's and that's a, what he's interested yeah. in now. It's I a think. kind of Socratic dialogue with himself. It's not a play. There's no dramatic momentum in it, and they do the best they can, but it's not. But you know, so that's why I didn't hate it because. I really hate a cynical, completely bankrupt enterprise that, you know, maybe we'll get to some of them later, but, <laughs> you know, I don't you think that Broadway? was it. But Glenn Carey Glenn it. Ross is a great play. How about this production? Well, that production is okay. Yeah. <laughs> Just like, you know, not the best praise. Uh, I don't think Pacino actually You're starts very shaky and gets better and better as he goes along, which is good for him because it works sure. with what happens help. to the character. Very good coincidence okay. there. But see, my theory about this production is that it's actually an immersive theater production. What? Where they put you in the mood <laughs> of the guys being fleeced on stage by charging $377 for a premium seat, $15 <laughs> for ginger ale <laughs> at the bar, which I sadly now know firsthand. And, <laughs> and Elizabeth. It is just, it's, if you think of it as a <laughs> meta production where the audience is fleeced, like the guys in the play. I mean, it's just brilliant. Elizabeth, if David words. Mamet were here, he would not approve of your lefty French talk. Exactly no, right. But the market? He's not in the performance <laughs> art game. Well, what is your opinion to Mamet, uh, uh, Charles? The, well, the, the, the whole career, the whole... The... I think he wrote some great plays. You know, they're in the past now. I think maybe for the past 15 years, he hasn't written a, a worthwhile play. Um, the thing that struck me about this play is that... Uh, the Anarchist. You know, 
the anarchist is that he's completely, he always was a stylized writer, his dialogue is not naturalistic, but he's completely lost touch with the way human beings speak. I mean, there was not a word in the, in the play was that the play. was, you know, remotely resembling human speech. Well, the other problem is that you, you also direct himself now. It's a just terrible idea. Mm. Terrible idea. Yeah. Well, especially because he, 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 he hates actors. <laughs> I mean, I think that's, <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's right. I mean, he, like, most, most of his work seems to be about sort of removing actors from the acting process, removing acting from the acting process, or, you know, <laughs> it, it just getting everything, you know, slimmed down to the point where it's just David Mamet's thoughts. And I, I think maybe he achieved that with this play. Uh, I mean, I, I, I have no trouble with, you know, stylized dialogue. I mean, I love stylized dialogue. I, I might have loved this stylized dialogue if, it, if there were anything animating it, but, but there wasn't. I mean, I feel like it was just completely dehydrated. It had been just reduced to, uh, my arguments. Um, all right, what about this um, for the, the family season, uh, revival of Annie, which I always thought was a jolly, fun, old uh, uh, family musical. Is this uh, done well, this production, Elizabeth? I think it's, it's done pretty well. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, it it's a little, feels a little underpopulated at times. Mm. Uh, you know, there's only six orphans, six or seven orphans in the, in the sweatshop, and it's just not enough. <laughs> You got enough to make a sweater. Gone, oh, no, like seven really. girls. What are you going to get? One more girls? suffering orphan. That's, I liked it. I mean, I, 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 I didn't, I didn't think it was like the greatest production of Annie of all time. I, I, I thought it was like a, a perfectly competent reproduction of what we expect from Annie. I mean, it didn't, it, it did well, not get between me and what. I, you know, I, I think okay. I think people reacted a little negatively to it because it is not as love me an Annie. I mean, I, I, I don't I don't think she is a love me Annie. I don't think she is like necessarily this, you know. Charles, does this warm your, your critics? Uh, I've forgotten Annie already, to be honest. I mean, it was, you know, it was a per perfectly pleasant couple of hours in the theater and but, you know, it's not a show I have any great affection for. I mean, it's a kid show. But um, and I was never a kid. I do have a big caveat with that show, actually, which is I, 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 Katie Finneran gives, I think I described it, after, I said her performance as Miss Hennigan is, is completely right and completely wrong. I think she's completely wrong for the part. She's really fun to watch. I was she's too pretty. I had a big smile every time she was on stage, but she's wrong for the part. She's so too young, she's too pretty. She's I, I really, I, I, yeah, there's no sense of meanness. There's no sense that she's really a dragon. Yes. With those kids, you never get the sense. You never fear for the kids, and you should. Now, there's a revival of a fine old uh, Clifford Odets play on Broadway called Golden Boy, which you liked quite a bit, Charles. I thought it was terrific. I mean, Bartlett Sher, I think, really understands Odets in a way, and he can make that language sing again. And sometimes you read it on the page, and you think there's no way this is going to sound anything other than completely hokey. <laughs> and he, you know, picks actors who know how to do it, and I think it was a really vital, exciting production. of It's not a top drawer Odette's, but I thought it was really one of the best productions of the fall season. But a good old-fashioned, well-made play, right? I mean, it really, it's got a good engine and yeah, I mean, conflict. Oh, yeah. and you, you can't argue with a boxing story. I mean, you can do almost anything with a boxing <laughs> story. Yeah. A, a boxing story can be anything. It can be, it can be, it can be a great right-wing story. It can be a great <laughs> left-wing story. I'd love to see what <laughs> David <laughs> Manama does with a boxing story. They, they don't, they just... <laughs> Talk to each other from opposite. Mamet probably owes a lot to Odets, though, in a way. I mean, just yeah. in terms of that, uh, in, in terms of his language, especially mm -hmm. his kind of like early period language, mm -hmm. just that kind of, you know, uh, that sort of, you know, that uh, combination of like old school New York argot and, yeah. you know, something else. But isn't, the, isn't this old uh, Odette stuff kind of like old lefty commie stuff, Elizabeth? No. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth. <laughs> Give us your French perspective yes, on this. You know, you know what's great about it? It's, it's, it's a completely like great lyrical lang language, and you hear that, and it just has such passion, which is completely devoid from like the new writers now. This is like my completely obsession. But the, all these like MFA kids, there's just no yeah. drive to what they do because they write for 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 grants and for awards, and, and who cares? They come out of the Yadarma school, and they're they're. There's nothing driving there, but they are so boring. At least with Odette's, you knew what was driving him. It's all on, it's all on the page. Passion, anger at the world. Y yes, we're, there's none of that now. It's not come down well, to part of the old playwrights. You know. Well, you're going to say Detroit, I think. Lisa yes, Moore. That is a with play a that few has, exceptions. You know, I, it's I definitely agree. engaged with what's going yes. on in the country. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but know, we so have not seen Detroit yet, have we? Is it? No. no. Oh, we have. Oh, yeah. I haven't seen it well, yet. We, we saw it and it left. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's the thing. It didn't make it to Broadway because it didn't have big stars. And, uh, you know, I think you can get it. It did have it. stars, though. Yeah, but, well, uh, you know, they didn't, they, for whatever Schwimmer. reason, they weren't commercial they enough, enough viable, you know, viable <laughs> for Broadway. And, you know, you couldn't get a ticket. Well, it sold out its round of playwrights, and that was that, which is a shame, because all the new plays on Broadway this season, so yeah. far, Our have been completely and it's negligible. in retrospect, because originally it was supposed to be on Broadway. 
They announced it on Broadway, and then right. they changed their mind. Yeah, that's right. Whoever is there, there is. is. Jeffrey Richards, <laughs> who <laughs> decided to bring Chinglish in instead, and wasn't that a great, you know, <laughs> boon to Broadway. And uh, <laughs> I have a soft spot for Chinglish. Yeah, Detroit. Oh, really? <laughs> oh. Well, Jennifer no. Levin. Uh, I think, uh, oh, Scott, Scott, do you want to put in a good, I heard you trying to get in there when Elizabeth was running down these uh, new playwrights. Do you want to put a, a good word for some of these uh, academic Artificial dull. <laughs> <laughs> Leah, let's definitely categorize them that way. Let's just let's 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 reframe the dialogue. I mean, I, I mean, it sounds like one of them reframing well, the dialogue. Right. Let's reframe the dialogue. Well, okay, let's just not call them the MFA kids. Let's say like, the, there are a lot of exciting young playwrights and a lot of exciting plays going on and off Broadway right now. And well, I tend to agree with I, Elizabeth, though. I mean, I, I drift to the old timers like Edward Albee. I mean, I think every, but you don't every see young playwright should watch. Michael. Well, yeah, but <laughs> rare right, occasions I go with it. But you sit there and you see who's afraid of Virginia Woolf, and you want all of these young MFA playwrights to go and realize that every scene should have tension and should crackle and there should be two people going up against each other and you should just keep ratcheting the tension, ratcheting the tension. Well, go, down, right. go downtown. Go downtown to Soho Rep and see a play that has a title that is way too long for me to repeat on this show because it would take on another, another taping to get through it. Uh, it starts, we are proud to present a presentation about the Herrero of Namibia. We are proud to present a presentation about the Herrero of Namibia, formerly known as Southwest Africa, from the German Sudwest Africa, between the years 1884 and 1915. If you want tension, but that, but attention that is kind of not bound up in the voice, I think the way that we're talking about, then check out this show. It's you know it's about an ensemble of actors who are trying to put together uh, a theater piece about a genocide and get and very quickly get in over their head. But the play right there, Jackie Sibley's Jewelry, she's about 30. Uh, she lives in Brooklyn, and uh, you know this is her first uh, big show downtown, and uh, it's exciting. It's another, it's another way to uh, create tension in the theater. A good old, a good old play that you liked a lot, Charles, revived uh, uh, very well off Broadway is the Piano Lesson, August Wilson play. You, you, you thought this was a terrific production. I really did, and I think you know when you see an August Wilson play done that well, you sort of feel like you know. A lot of players today are writing very puny plays. Yeah, I mean, the, the majesty yeah. of his language, uh, the, the arc of his narratives, and how each character has a you know fully realized story behind it. I mean, I think it's, I think that's one of his best plays in this production. I think it's really one of the Who's one of in finest. It? Um, you know, not major. Chuck Cooper, you probably wonderful know, actor. he's a musical He's, theater actor. he's actor. terrific. Uh, Rosalind Ruff. Uh, she's fantastic. Is, you know, the female lead, and she has this intense presence, but very still. And um, the two brothers. Brandon Durden Brandon. and uh, Jason yes. Durden, I think. Uh, who are also very terrific. I think across the board it was And well the director? Uh, Ruben Santiago Hudson, right. who, right. you know. Who's done a lot of music. Who knows from August Wilson. We haven't talked about Dead Account. But, well, I, Dead Accounts, I hear, is a terrific play by my good friend Teresa Rabeck, <laughs> and I think that's all we need to say about Dead Accounts. <laughs> <laughs> Let's Where are you hearing that from? Scott. <laughs> <laughs> but, but wait, hold on. Wait, hold on. No. Dead, Dead, Account? my... Dead Account like, stars Katie Holmes. Is Katie Holmes, uh, now that she's free of Tom Cruise, is she a major theatrical presence? Uh, let's see. How'd I answer that? Um, would she, is that to suggest that she would have been uh, less of a major theatrical presence if Tom Cruise had been there, she like, was on her Tom leg? Cruise like, had, the, uh, I would have seen so. that play. I would love that play. <laughs> right, right. Um, um, you're not a big fan of Dead Accounts, I take it. Uh, no, I mean, I, I feel like... <laughs> Well, first of all, is is it is it true I'm not on Smash next season? You're not on Smash. I, I definitely well, I have nothing. Well, I, have nothing isn't right I don't think she's on okay. Smash. Okay. Well, that, oh, oh, that's, oh, that's true. That's true. That's true. We're both not on Smash. All right. Am I going to be in any of Teresa Rayback's upcoming plays? No. no. All right. Well then, uh, I think I mean, Dead Accounts to me read like a play whose original title was Tyler Perry's Teresa Rayback's Dead Accounts. Like it, it it felt like to me just like one of those sort of. I, I don't know, it's just like one step away from church circuit inspirational theater or something. I mean, like, there's there's something about the easy kind of, you know, division of the country into God-fearing, uh, wholesome rubes and uh, horrible coastal uh, plutocrat vampires that I just find kind of stupid, I guess <laughs> is the word I'm looking for. I just yeah. like, I thought it was a stupid play uh, very brilliantly performed by Norbert Leo Butz. I, you know, I mean, who can obviously do anything? Uh, and uh, I thought Katie Holmes did a fine job in a role she's not right for. Yeah. Charles, um, you, uh, you, you look. The guy see the look of disdain yeah, on your well, face. Well, I, I feel it's a very negligible piece of writing that is only on Broadway because of Katie Holmes, obviously. And I felt I, she has bad management. It's such a thankless role. She spends most of the time whining. She has one speech, maybe. 
um, you know, complaining about I'm stuck at home with my parents and you know, and I have to lose upbraiding weight. her brother. I mean, I just <laughs> yeah. felt it was it was just you know, increasingly we're seeing these very small scale, yep. uh, you know, really uninteresting plays on Broadway simply for reasons that you know they can get a star to do them. But you know, mm. who are the managers advising these stars? Well, I think part of that is well, because you just you cannot put a um, <laughs> this is a bit bit off, but if you'll follow my point, you can't put a Katie Holmes type, let's say, into a play like The Piano Lesson that requires really big, big, serious, meaty actors. Mm -hmm. And most of these movie stars they slip in have to go into these puny plays which don't require the kind of operatic performances that you have to give in Is a great Albie play well, or a great piano. Yes and no, I think. No, 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 well, no. if it's a new play, I think I think the more it looks like a, a, like an existing television script, the safer it feels to the to management. Or, I, I, mean, there, I mean, Jessica Chastain is not in a new play. She is in, in The Heiress. The Heiress, which is a very solid play. Uh, so it, it's not, you know, and then you do have the some, you know, screen actors who have really thankless screen parts and and flourish on stage. Yeah. So it it can happen in in very uh, in very difficult parts. So, yeah. all right, we got to wrap it up. I want to ask you guys though, um, the absolute worst thing that you have seen that you saw in the fall that almost made you want to resign as a drama <laughs> critic that drove you out of the theater. Scott, anything where you just sit there and you think I cannot go on with this life anymore? Up. <laughs> oh. uh, Lay it on a little thick there, Michael. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think... Did you I, bring the razor blades? <laughs> <laughs> there were, um, there were certainly, uh, there were certainly moments during some of the uh, musical numbers in, in Scandalous, I think, where... <laughs> Kathy Lee Gifford and certain... <laughs> uh, although, you know, something like that is so wonderfully uh, uh, awful that, uh, you know... It, it, there, there, there's nothing like you know being you know watching uh, fake Irish immigrants dance around for no reason I could actually discern <laughs> and singing uh, Hey little lassie come show me your assy uh, <laughs> because they, you know they're Irish and so they're drunk and uh, they're having a and they're on a steamship so <laughs> that's what happens yeah the, the moments like that you know I, I don't know if you want to kill yourself or just stand up and say thank you because my review is written and uh, <laughs> time for Charles the thing that almost drove well, you out of the profession. You know, I didn't even have fun at that. It sounded, I wish I had your experience. I, that, <laughs> I didn't find it, you know, campily bad enough. I think um, the anarchist yeah. really was the low point for me. I that mean, was there, the matter. Especially since, you know, here's in the, you know this play was only on Broadway because of this man's name. These actors, fine actors, are doing it only because of, you know, it's a mammoth play. And everybody, I think it was an embarrassment to everyone in the theater, including the audience and the Ushers. <laughs> and you, Elizabeth, the one that what, made you almost well, put down your the pen? The one that. Bury your head in your The hands. most recent one, so that's the one that comes to mind, is uh, Trojan Women at BAM, which was based on Euripides and rewritten, directed by Anne Bogart, who's a kind of big figure of the experimental scene. Yeah, yeah. But her problem is that she always works with her own company, the CT company, and they generate the text, and they're actors and they cannot write. Some of them can, can barely act as well. <laughs> But they can't write, so <laughs> you have, I, I believe, a very gifted director working with crap text, where those Trojan women are saying things like, they destroy Troy. <laughs> 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 and I am thinking, See, it gets yes, right they to the point. just <laughs> say, they destroy <laughs> Troy. <laughs> destroy Troy and They destroy Troy. And look at his great when she works asses. with, I thought her dead man's <laughs> cell phone, the Sarah role play, was wonderful. She's good when she works with a good text. Yeah. Actors should not write their own things. Nope. Right, right. I want to say that every show that opened in the fall, except Annie, will be closed by the end of this month. So whether they were limited runs or they failed, they'll be closed. So a whole bunch of theaters are opening up for all new things. Right, but let's end on a high note. What, what are you guys looking forward to in the spring? Elizabeth? Well, speaking of uh, Hollywood stars, I'm really looking forward to A Cat on a Hot Tin Roof with, with Scarlett Johansson, Scarlett Johansson in, yeah. in January. And Scott, what are you looking forward to? Uh, I'm excited about uh, Matilda. I've heard good things about that. Musical Revolting right. Children. Yes. I can't wait. Right, yeah. <laughs> the musical coming in from London based on the Raoul Dahl book. Yeah. Right, right. And also, you know, just yeah, things that are... I'm, I'm, I'm pretty delighted with what's going on off-Broadway and even off-off-Broadway. Something right off-Broadway that's mm -hmm. going to catch your interest? Um, I actually can't 
uh, nothing comes immediately to mind, but I'm I, because oh, I'm. Forgetting. How could you forget the Jesse Eisenberg and uh, oh, the Vanessa Jesse Redgrave <laughs> collaboration? That blows yes, my Jesse mind. Jesse Eisenberg and Vanessa Redgrave will be collaborating on something. What, what do they the, do? I don't know about that. I, 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 I have no idea if that. It's a Jesse uh, Eisenberg I, play I in which she co-stars with it. Vanessa Redgrave in a tiny little at the Cherrylin Theater. Or something. Oh, so the like that. Let's hope that actor can write. Some crazy. Yeah, let's hope that actor can write. I'll go. He's already written a play. The Charles, you're looking forward to. Um, I'm actually looking forward to Belleville, the Amy Herzog play. That maybe you should skip it, Elizabeth. It's a really exciting new play, very entertaining. Well, here's hoping for um, uh, lots of uh, fun, spirited, big plays in the spring. No more puny ones with movie stars. Although that said, I'm looking forward to Lucky Guy starring Tom Hanks because I like Nora Ephron and oh. I knew Mike McAlary, the columnist that it's based on, and I think it could be quite an interesting play that captures the end of an era of horrible Nora papers. Ephron. What? Horrible <laughs> Nora Ephron. She's I cannot dead. How stand can you say her. That? Why are you? She's dead. Be kind. She she's created a thousand monsters with her horrible rewriting of the codes of romantic comedy. She, I blame her for all the romantic comedy crap that is flooding <laughs> our screens. Okay. All goes back to Nora Ephron. Well, My own ass well, for nothing. <laughs> like everyone else in New York, I was one of her best friends, so I'm oh. deeply, <laughs> deeply offended. Oh, God. Rest, um, in peace, Nora. <laughs> Rest in peace, Nora Ephron. I'm, I'm looking forward to lucky guy. All right. Thanks a lot. Elizabeth Vincentelli from the New York Post, Charles Isherwood, veteran drama critic of the New York Times, and Scott Brown. As opposed to old drama critic of the New York Times. <laughs> and Scott Brown from New York Magazine. Thanks <laughs> a lot for being our guest tonight on Theater Talk. <laughs> Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>